about. Obviously, from uh, that biography, I'm either a schizophrenic with multiple personalities. Uh, <laughs> you're you're going to wonder what I'm talking about, given what, what I've done in the past. But in part, this is um, trying to extend some of the, the methods of inquiry and ethnobotany and linguistics and ethnohistory that I've been engaged in with, with colleagues at U of A and other universities um, to some of the issues of, of um, spice trade and how it, it foreshadows a lot of the processes of globalization that affect all of us every day. We're sort of like uh, um, uh, fish in the ocean of globalization that may not recognize each moment that we're being affected by processes that were put in place hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. But nevertheless, they affect all of us in very interesting and profound ways. So I'm going to jump into this. Um, and I'm afraid it may not be the detective story that that one reader thought, but uh, uh, hang on with me because I'm going to be making some leaps uh, here and there that I hope you can stick with. I'm going to say that uh, uh, the Middle Eastern um, spice traders may not have been the only people at uh, 350 or uh, 3,500 years ago who engaged in trading medicinal plants culinary herbs, other aromatics like incense to people elsewhere. But somehow something very interesting happened on the Arabian Peninsula that uh, sort of coalesced a lot of threads of that, uh, that process of uh, uh, trade beyond your homeland um, into um, what I believe was the precursors of the globalized economic system that we live in today. And I think we can learn a lot about how globalization has affected us negatively and positively by going back and sort of uh, cleaning off the, the layers of veneer and looking at the very initial structure and how that structure has changed through time. So, you know, the, the first big question for those of you who work in this building, many esteemed scholars in both uh, Middle Eastern and Judaic studies, is, is uh, why be attentive to a study by, by someone who has actual, absolutely no track record <laughs> of working in the Middle East? And um, I'm used to having no track record, and I kind of enjoy it. But, but the point <laughs> is, uh, there's, there's some things that, that um, using some methodologies of integrating different kinds of data from various disciplines might shed light on that, that uh, may not be the mix of, of, um, of inquiries that are currently being used by Middle Eastern scholars, but certainly uh, ones that, that I welcome collaboration uh, from them on that I think can broaden our perspective on some of these issues. So particularly, I'm, I'm looking at uh, what we have learned of, from the political economic studies that are done in many disciplines of the social sciences and what uh, ecologists, human ecologists, have learned about how environmental influences set up certain conditions that then the political economy works on. It's not that it's environmental determinism. People act one way if they're from desert climates or anything like that, as Jared Diamond and other people have have sort of rammed, uh, hammered uh, down on us. But, but uh, there's this interplay between ecological and economic, social, and political factors that I think we can begin to integrate. Um, the, so the book spends a lot of time on how uh, historically certain events and cultural processes were set up in the Middle East that then spread to other regions, and literally from China into Latin America, Mexico, and the Southwest. And we'll get to that at the end. Um, and, but because it, it's in way a food history, I'm also talking about the way that we can now use different disciplines to trace how particular spices moved around the world, particularly through ethnolinguistics, and the way that certain recipes changed uh, from Persian or Arab roots through North Africa into the Maghreb, Andalusia, Mexico, and then up into the Southwest. So we can now trace those chains through both recipes 
and the names of spices and find out some very interesting things by doing so. And, and finally, I'm very interested in broadly looking at um, the, the collaboration and competition uh, at different points in time of a variety of Semitic peoples, uh, uh, Jewish, Arab, Nabataean, Sabaean, uh, and, and looking at how um, that varied heterogeneous um, uh, set of interactions through time um, uh, showed that, that at times there, were, there was complete collaboration between these different Semitic cultures. They were really rowing in the same direction or one group was piggybacking on the, the trade routes and economic structures that the other had used. And other times they were clearly in, in competition. And that, it, that this is sort of a reminder that that, that uh, varied history allows us many possibilities in the future, that it's not simply that, that Jewish Arab history, particularly among spice traders, has always been competitive or confrontational. So let's get going. First, um, how can we learn from spice traders themselves about the logic and the ethics of how they go about doing their work, which is inherently extra local? I mean, I, I think Ann was just kind of saying, I'm, I'm a local food guy. What in the heck am I, I, I doing, paying so much attention to, to how food moves extra locally and even uh, between continents? And I think if we don't understand that, what we, choose to do with lo the local food movement is very different than if we ignored the fact that still here in Arizona, 98% of our food comes from someplace else. So wh what, what is the logic and ethics of the people who've had as their trade the, the extra local, interregional, intercontinental movement of food, particularly spices? And how does that foreshadow what we call globalization today. I'm going to use the word aromatics almost interchangeably with spice trade off and on. And aromatics is really a much broader term that Patricia Crone and other people have used to say um, little things that are very potent that we either eat, use as cures, use as aphrodisiacs, or use spiritually. Okay, So they're both sacred and profane. But they're small quantities that can be carried long distances and still have tremendous potency um, in terms of their chemistry, their fragrances, et cetera. So if you, if you get confused when I say aromatics, is he talking about spices? I'm not just talking about culinary herbs and spices, but a broader range of categories. And of course, many of these plants are used for multiple purposes. And, and I think one of the things that drove me to do uh, this is that that I have not been a Middle Eastern study uh, uh, guy most of my life. I've, I've um, paid attention more to American studies. And I've been sort of surprised the last uh, 10 years that people like Charles Mann, Jared Diamond, Alfred Crosby, and, and Fernandez Armisto, who I think is the best among them, um, uh, pretend that globalization started with Columbus landing in the West Indies. And it's, it's just sort of an unbelievable thing to me. Yes, that got some trade network set up that extended into the new world. But if we're really talking about structure and process, every th single thing that we see having occurred in the first 100 years in the Americas was already in place with actually some of the same people involved in it. And it was no different a jump than when the spice traders moved into Madagascar or the, or the Cape region of South Africa or, or, uh, or China. So I think when we talk about globalization, we're not just talking about a boat like Magellan's going around the world. He didn't even make it around the world, for God's sake. But we're talking about uh, uh, processes and, and economic structures. So uh, again, I, I did it in part to caution my um, my Americanist friends from thinking that everything was made up when Europeans got to America. So first of all, let's, let's start out with a very simple exercise, a thumbnail sketch of just one spice mer merchant. Uh, this man I met in a, a border town that might be likened to Nogales in some ways, Sultan Ishkashim, on the Tajikistan-Afghanistan border. 
not in the Middle East, but I think indicative of the training that has gone on with Middle Eastern, um, North African, and Central Asian spice traders for centuries. A trade passed on from your father, grandfather, etc. cetera. Uh, this man was fifth generation spice trader at least. And when I asked him to identify the, the uh, spices and incenses in the jars he's holding, um, he's, he said, well, what, uh, what language do you want the name in? <laughs> and, and I said, well, well, like for instance, tell me about that one. And he gave me uh, the names of each of those aromatics in 10 different languages. And I said, well, how do you know that? Is this because this is a crossroad of one trade route coming up from the Khyber Pass and another one that's one of the, the chains of the Silk Road? And he said, well, that's in part true that people come here to get my spices, but it's also because as an apprentice, I went and I learned about the spices where they were being harvested and produced. So my apprenticeship was my grandfather setting me out to different areas where these were produced and of course visiting all the stopovers or way stations along the way. So it was not only that I learned the quality or the different qualities of something like saffron from the way people harvested, it, dried it, and treated it so I could see what products were being given to me when I were, was given them to sell them and had to price them, but also I learned the different uses that different cultures applied to these things. So in ways, his knowledge was not local knowledge, it was globalized knowledge that depended upon him knowing the whole trajectory from where the spice originated to where he was selling it. And he did this um, by going east and west as far as Samarkand in the, uh, to the west and I think either to, um, I can't remember, Almaty in, in uh, Kazakhstan or the Turpan Basin in China to the east and then down through the Khyber Pass and actually into India. So, so he, was, he had a lot of esoteric knowledge here before he actually took over the business from his father and grandfather. And I think that's a different way than most of us have been trained over uh, time uh, in whatever profession we are. We go back to the origins of something, learn the, the quality, the factors that make the quality, and all the intervening steps in the food supply chain or the economic supply chain. And I find that very, very interesting. And so um, in part, we assume that people are just aware of what is known from their contacts in what is called transit trade, which is often interregional trade. It would be like people in the 18th or 19th century coming up on a steamboat, believe it or not, that happened from Nogales to Tucson and bringing things from northern Mexico up to here from the next watershed down. That's kind of what we mean by transit trade. But his knowledge went beyond that to multiple basins, multiple landscapes, and he was, his real sales value was that he could tell customers, well, this is the finest saffron that came from this area, but this area has a special kind of saffron in flavor and color, et cetera. So he integrated knowledge from different parts of the trade routes, and that's really why people should come to him at that marketplace rather than someone who just sort of stumbled into the business uh, because someone died and he took over the stand. So what I'm getting at is people were really trained in a way that connected the dots between the place of origin of different spices and where they were selling them and passing knowledge, not just the spices themselves, on to other people for their use. Okay, so I think I just said this. It's not local knowledge, it's globalized knowledge in a way, however you may see the range of globalization at a particular time in history. And the political structures um, of transcontinental and oceanic trade that eclipsed regional or transit trade go back 3,500 years. I think that's remarkable that we, we tend to think, well, here in Arizona, the whole com may have traded salt down to the Gulf of California, but they really didn't move around. 
Well, we now know that Pushtekin traders from the Valley of Mexico were regularly up this far and into the Santa Fe area. In fact, they brought chocolate up all the way from the Mayan region of Mexico into the, into the Santa Fe area and Chaco Canyon. And so what I'm trying to point out is that by about 3,500 years ago, we, we have uh, items moving from uh, the coast of Yemen and, and uh, coast of southern Oman all the way uh, up towards uh, Basra uh, out of the Indian Ocean and uh, 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 Persian Gulf uh, uh, through the Straits of Hormuz and, and really uh, um, influencing people's cuisines and, and uh, 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 health and, and economies well beyond the place of origin. So wh what's that about? Uh, why do we even care about getting something from someplace else other than you know, what Edward Said would call the love of the exotic or the oriental, which is this romantic notion of, of uh, something uh, being exotic, particularly the things from the Middle East for much of, of uh, uh, European history. Well, there's another reason, an ecological reason, that this kind of trade was established. People in desert landscapes are, in, are for the most part, living in areas with low productivity, rather low diversity of, of foodstuffs in any particular place, but a lot of diversity if you move from patch to patch. In other words, what you may have in the closest patch of desert near your house may not be enough to live on, but if you combine it with what people might have on the top of Mount Lemmon, over on the San Pedro River, out by Bobby Kivari Peak, and you're trading items within a day's reach or three days, you begin to accumulate uh, heterogeneity of foods in your diet and medicinal plants that, that may keep you healthy. And, and it's inherent in the structure of desert ecosystems that you have this patchiness of resources and what ecologists call a high turnover of beta diversity. Beta diversity is the number of species that you have in one place that are different from the species in the next place. So that's what we mean by turnover. That's, it's the, the difference between what may grow here and what may grow in Phoenix, for example. So um, desert peoples, because they could rather easily travel longer distances, um, um, but, but had low diversity and low pr productivity where they were, tried to find things that they could sell to people in other places, particularly desert nomads selling to people who had higher productivity in isolated desert oases, like uh, the, the oases by the Marib Dam in, in Yemen and other, other places in Yemen that had very high productivity. What can you offer those people in exchange for the staples that they can grow in those oases. And one of the things that uh, I've looked at with uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Haji Farah, who graduated from here just a few years ago, is this whole um, uh, perspective in relation to frankincense, which was one of the first items that appeared in globalized trade, making it to India and later to China, but only grows in a very localized distribution of Yemen and Oman. And so this is a, a, a broken branch of, of the um, frankincense shrub. I wouldn't call it a tree because it seldom gets uh, beyond uh, head height, even though you'll see a picture of one about 14, 15 feet in height. But that, that milky sap, just like what a milkweed plant here in the desert might have, then hardens into this uh, uh, globular, uh, crystal-like um, um, uh, pebble that then has incredible potency both as a, as a fragrance, an antibiotic, a vermifuge, and some people say an aphrodisiac. And since I think aphrodisiacs are part what you believe, go for it. If you think it's an aphrodisiac, it's an aphrodisiac. So frankincense is one of those things that occurs in highly localized area, mostly in the Dofar Highlands uh, uh, of Oman, where these wonderful people that are called the 
al-Jabali or mountain talkers live, and uh, where I harvested uh, frankincense, and in the Hadramid of of, um, uh, of Yemen, but vast distances of low productivity, like the empty empty quarter, um, between these these localities and between them and their markets. And, and so, so they were taking something very small, very potent, and what they learned to do was mythologize it, uh, which means to increase its value by telling great stories about its potency that sort of lured people in and kept people attracted to it. They were marketers through their storytelling. And the same thing happened here that that the uh, autumn people, the Papago and Pima here, used to go down to the Gulf of California not only to get salt, but to get dreams from nomadic people who had no corner beans in their own repertoire. So they traded dream songs for corn and beans. <laughs> and if you use that analogy, I think that's what happened with many of these spices. You were not just selling the chemical content of the item, you were selling this mythic uh, uh, aura, this, this incredible cultural context that circulated around it. And, and to the point where, where the Greeks believed that there were flying snakes that protected frankincense uh, groves that would kill anyone who, who tried to come and get it. Uh, that th there were a lot of ritual observations for harvesting it, that, that men had to move out of the house out of the out of the house from, uh, with their wives, be celibate the entire time of the harvest, and practice other ritual observations. So, this occurs not for something that's a purely economic commodity. This this is something that you do when you're trying to instill the the mythic or spiritual dimensions of a of a plant or animal product. And so, so we, these uh, gathering grounds were even concealed. No one knew where frankincense came from. No one knew where many of these spices came from. They were, consider, they were concealed. If you sold them to someone who was a camel caravaneer, uh, you made them promise not to tell where it came from, or even better, they made up stories of other places where these things came from. So I'm losing something off the top there, but, but I think the point I'm trying to make here is that um, uh, a little bit of frankincense sold in the Dofar Highlands of Oman would sell for a thousand times that initial value when it got to Rome or Athens. Okay, And, um, and I don't think that's simply because it had a lot of cool chemicals in it. Obviously, they didn't know the chemicals. They knew it had a great fragrance. But this is that every step along that intercontinental trade route, it became mythologized even more and more. And we know from Herodotus and other uh, Greek and Roman sources how much this is true, to the point where Julius Caesar complained that the entire Roman Empire was going to go bankrupt because even the middle class was spending so much of their um, expendable incomes on frankincense and other incenses that it was bankrupting the empire. Can you imagine that? I think it's like how I feel about my iPhone. Every time, you know, like every time I turn it on, there's another message saying, you've exceeded your number of hours. And anyway, I won't complain. So by Greek, Roman, Phoenician, and Nabataean eras, frankincense was the most highly valued substance, quote, in the known world, whatever that phrase means. No, uh, most highly uh, valued substance in global uh, trade, uh, uh, costing many times the value of a single day laborer's wages. Uh, and again, we're having trouble with these. Uh, dropping off the top for reasons I don't quite understand. But this is just to say that the domestication of camels that occurred in that 3,000 to 3,500 year period, archaeologists and zoologists are still debating about domestication times for the two camel species. But the point is that once camels were brought into the picture, they could carry these things much farther than horses and much heavier loads. So cam camels 
were the you know, technological innovation that allowed this international trade to happen. And, um, and to, to some extent, you get crazy things like this showing up in Baja, California of some uh, caricature or, or, um, or what I would uh, call, um, uh, I wouldn't say uh, um, uh, fully derogatory, but, but questionably um, uh, uh, representative thing of a of a uh, uh, era bringing tacos to people in this remote desert oasis. This was taken in a tiny little desert oasis in Baja California, and it, it's as if your food is brought to you long distances by Arab spice traders or something like that. <laughs> Very odd thing to see. But the point is that, that there were enormous incentives for desert nomads who lacked these staple crops to um, find items like frankincense that were highly transportable, unbreakable, uh, small, uh, uh, low weight, but, but um, you could carry a lot of it in, in a few camel bags. And some became the, the, the transit traders, some became the merchants who set those things up, uh, some uh, ran the caravanserai and, and hosted the traders, and others became pirates. We think that, that many of the Nabataeans before be capturing spice trade routes were actually pirates both in the desert and later in the Red Sea. Okay, so that's what gets interesting that, that uh, Arabs and other Semitic peoples first uh, developed the capacity to do this long distance trade with camel caravans and very quickly, as Albert Harani's book uh, points out, became masters of trans-oceanic navigation, perhaps not the first uh, uh, navigators who left coasts and, and uh, followed trade winds across the Indian Ocean and other things, but among the earliest, and to the point where dhows were metaphorically called the, the camels of the sea, and there was uh, 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 metaphorical use back and forth between uh, sea trade and, and, uh, and desert camel trade. And, and we even talk about the maritime Silk Roads, not just the Silk Road going through Central Asia. Okay, so these were enabling technologies, but I think the key uh, point here is that camels and dows didn't enable globalization to happen. It was the economic structures that Arab peoples uh, experimented with, innovated on, refined and then um, expanded into different parts of the world doing, during each subsequent uh, era. And um, some of the first harbors for trans-oceanic trade were along the Omani coast. My relatives lived in um, uh, Muscat and Salala and um, and a couple of the other port uh, ports. And then the interesting thing is that the treasure troves of the spices were not kept in the ports because they could easily be raided, but back 50, 60 miles in the mountains like Bahla Fort, uh, uh, again, a place that my own particular lineage has long history uh, there near uh, Jabal al-Akhtar in, in uh, north central Oman. So they kept the spices back away from the ports in, in fortresses so that so that pirates didn't know where they were coming from. And then they'd come in at night and go out on the boat in the morning. And we know from, the, there's a wonderful UNESCO museum near, in Salala that, that shows manuscripts predating Marco Polo of Arab journals of reaching the South China Sea. They're just remarkable documents that have yet to uh, surface much in analysis in English literature, but are well known in the Arab world. So there's many different groups of Semitic peoples that were involved in this, including these people we call ethnic Jewish traders that were living fully most of their lives in Oman, but they were out at sea part of the time. And through most of the, I mean, up through the 14th century, um, the, uh, uh, these uh, ethnic Jewish enclaves in Oman and Yemen and other countries were, were fully integrated into the Arab trade a cycle and these people uh, were were not considered competitors as much as 
as facilitators of components of the, of the uh, economic uh, transfers. And again, you even have that, see that kind of mixing historically in, in uh, the old city in Jerusalem. So, so many different people came together and had positive and competitive interactions. Of course, other sensibilities later influenced um, the Spice Trade, especially following the, the founding and spread of Islam. So I think one of the major things that most Middle Eastern scholars talk about is sort of the, the synergies that happened after the founding of Islam between Persian and Arab sensibilities and, and knowledges of trade routes and all of that. So you get sort of this hybridity that happened economically that then really helped this whole system to spread into the Islamic uh, empire. And the same thing happened with interactions between Berbers and, or their many names in, in North Africa and Arab peoples. Um, it not only extended the range of economic influence of uh, Arabs, but Islam helped codify and solidify certain economic precepts uh, for trading and banking that I think are really most interesting. And, and I think from this perspective, we need to revisit things like the, the stories told both by Jews and Arabs about the, the division between the Prophet Muhammad uh, and the Jews of, um, of Medina. Uh, historians have recently made the argument that, that Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad was regularly collaborating with some Jewish tribes, but had a standoff with, with one about locating where a free market could happen, where the market vendors would not be taxed, and that, that there was really an economic dispute, not just about the siting and who controlled the site, but about the economic vision for trade in um, the, the center of the Arabian Peninsula. And so we could argue that, that the, the schism between the Prophet Muhammad and the Jewish clans of that era was more about uh, his distaste for usury, the uh, high interest loans that were occurring and the taxing of market vendors than an outright diatribe against all Jewish people. So I think through this lens, we would revisit many historic events and how they're interpreted. Oh, I should say, by the way, after 30 years of working on heirloom fruits and vegetables in Oman, I found out that there's a, a, a date variety, an heirloom date named for my family uh, near Bahla Ford. And that's this little uh, um, um, uh, trader here who fell asleep behind his bananas and dates there just as we took, our, uh, took his photo. It was about 115 that day, so I was falling asleep too. But the, but the point is, if we, if we take this lens, we see a lot of historical events that have been interpreted purely as a spiritual or philosophical dispute as also one about economics and ethics. So here's a whole list too long to go into of some of the precepts and tenets of Islamic economic theory that I think were shaped by the fact that Khadija and, and the Prophet Muhammad were spice traders. These are the kinds of things if you're involved in moving spices from, from the center of the Arabian Peninsula up into Syria and, and uh, Palestine and perhaps even Turkey, uh, you think about and you think about what's the imbalances that you want to correct and you think about what um, uh, your vision for, for setting the system right is. And so very quickly within five years of, of the Prophet Muhammad's prophetic visions, we begin to see the rolling out of these concepts for I would say economic justice. And the irony to me is that I'm now on the board of a group called Slow Money that's trying to set up just uh, economic trade in food and farm products uh, nationally, internationally. And they've circled back to some of these same <laughs> products that you shouldn't, uh, that, that you should share the risks 
uh, this interdiction of chance, uh, not just so that farmers shoulder them all, but everyone in the food supply chain shares the risks of drought and floods and erratic weather rather than all of the debt being placed on the farmers themselves. So this whole set of concepts has been elaborated and there's many more and much more depth to it. But I'm saying what, what strikes me is that there was an economic theory of justice and equity that was in part what allowed the uh, Islamic empire to expand because there was extraordinary injustice and inequity in most parts of uh, the world before then that it was trying to to rectify. Whether it was successful or not is another issue, but the intention, the utopian ideals of the Prophet Muhammad were clearly as much about economic justice as other things. So these principles had such broad appeal that they even reached um, the South China Sea um, by 15, I'm sorry, by 516 AD, not 1516, uh, that, that uh, uh, the prophet's maternal uncle, uh, whose family had already been to, to China once, returned with the word about how um, uh, Islam would, would change international trade and perhaps provide uh, opportunities for equity and just trade between the Middle East and the Far East. And spice traders managed commerce along the Silk Road's for the Han Chinese for centuries after that. They almost became like live-in consultants in Han-dominated parts of China, controlling international um, uh, trade. Uh, by 651, they built the first mosque in Zaitong or Quanzhou. There's still debate whether Zaitong is actually Asetuna or, or Zaitun, the word for olive. Um, uh, scholars are on the both sides of that, but nevertheless, olives are now grown there. It's a fascinating thing. And there's uh, stelae and, and other evidence of a strong uh, Arab enclave in Zaitun for centuries, 20 to 40,000 spice traders and their families, and thousands of Jewish traders as well. And it was a thrill to get on the ground and see this archaeological evidence. Again, I, I apologize for, for uh, this cutoff, but Ibn Battuta calls this Zaitun Harbor the largest in the world in uh, 1346. In 1973, archeologists um, pulled out of the water near this bridge uh, a cargo ship of spices and have identified dozens, if not hundreds of different kinds of spices and aromatics that go all the way back to the Persian Gulf, and then some are from Goa and parts of India, but it's clear that, that this uh, ship, particular ship, had gone all the way to the Persian Gulf because of the kind of debris that was associated with the spices, not just the spices themselves. So there was very, very active trade, and again, it was sort of this uh, Arab enclave of specialists, Arab and Jewish enclave of specialists, um, uh, managing this. And uh, they, the remnants of those people are now called the Ding Hui in, in China. There's other Hui in the Turpan Basin where Michael Bonine uh, studied the Kerez water aqueducts and things like that. But one of the key moments in the relationships with China was that uh, the Arab and Persian uh, Muslims there um, got frustrated that that the, the Han Chinese did not understand how much they were bringing into their country's economy and what a small portion of it they themselves were getting for the work they were doing. And they established their own kingdom there that was quickly snuffed out within about five years. If you're 20,000 people and you're surrounded by millions of, of other people, it probably isn't a good idea to declare independence. Uh, um, and so they were quickly crushed. They were excluded from commerce for a number of years. And then they were so essential to it that they were brought back in as managers of, of commerce in the government, but with a lot of constraints on what their role would be. Okay, so as some of you know from um, Gavin Menzies' books, you know, there's been all this controversy about the how far um, 
China went, whether they went just to Africa with these large spice trading fleets or whether they went all the way to the Americas. What's seldom um, mentioned is that the, the real director of the largest fleet in history like that was also one of these ethnic Persian Arab descent um, uh, um, individuals that, that, who's called the, the Hui. There's still thousands of um, these people uh, in the Tur Turpan Basin on, on, on the edge of the Gobi. But so the, at different times, both the maritime trade out of China and the overland trade routes collapsed. They were cut off by, by the Mongolians and other groups that, that disrupted the control of these different groups. Um, and yet, where the trade routes were maintained, um, more and more centralized control occurred. And one group that perhaps began in India that then include Arab and Persian and even um, Berber and Jewish elite families soon came to control 99% um, of the wealth in the world. They were the 1% that controlled uh, most of the wealth from international trade. Uh, they, they make Carlos Slim and, and uh, Bill Gates look like paupers compared to what kind of wealth they accumulated in just one or two uh, generations. And then we really see this flip to sort of the negative aspects of globalization really beginning to accelerate as the control of whole trade systems from Portugal to China. You could write a check in one place, it would be honored in the other, became controlled by, by these small elites. And um, a similar tra trajectory of influences can be traced across the Maghreb into Andalusia. And after the Karimi fell, um, a, a group called the Radonite Jews uh, established similar control and became incredibly wealthy. They also moved spices through uh, Europe at a time where, when Christians and, and Muslims could not trade. And most of this came through Turkey. And just a few families really became wealthier than kings and queens and were able to basically, when they wanted to, embargo the Vatican so that no goods were coming in and out of the Vatican. They were so powerful. So they were economically more powerful than any political regime in Europe, Africa, or Asia at the time. And again, um, sorry for whatever lines are up there. So, so by 1492, we see Spanish basically uh, uh, terrified of the, the intellectual and economic power of both Jews and um, Muslims. And, and both are evicted. That Holocaust, I, I always need to remind my Jewish friends, was against both Muslim and Jewish people, one of the three Holocausts that Jews talk about. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of, of Jews and Arabs uh, uh, killed, uh, others converting, uh, Andalusia being taken over, um, and the quality of education, commerce, art, poetry, and everything suddenly declines in an area that had been in its golden years a few centuries before. And, and to the fact that even today, the, the number of spices found in a common Andalusian Christian market are about a 50th of what you can find across the Straits of Gibraltar and Morocco. In other words, even though Andalusia was as rich as Morocco is, Fez is today one of the great uh, hallmarks of, of, of international cuisine. Um, uh, the diversity and richness and, and influence uh, completely eroded after the Inquisition. And what we found is that, obviously we know that many of the Arabs went back across the Straits to, to Morocco, as did Jews. But more importantly, many of them went to Portugal and then after Columbus on to the Canary Islands and, and from there, many of them became the founding families of trade colonies in the Caribbean and, um, and Latin America. 
so that within 50 to 80 years of the establishment of the first European, quote unquote, colonies in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, the entire economic control of chilies, chocolate, vanilla, allspice, achiote, and a number of other spices was all under uh, the control of these crypto-Jewish and crypto-Muslim families. And you will not see the term crypto-Muslim in much of the American literature. There's about 1,200 papers in referee journals about crypto-Jews in the Americas, including in New Mexico, at least five books about crypto-Jews in New Mexico. Esteban Arellano says that he could take any of us up to northern New Mexico and by the names used for things in the acequia system, the irrigation landscape of uh, fields and orchards and uh, springs and pastures, he can tell you which of those communities were were of Muslim origin and which were of Jewish origin. Uh, and that whole structure was set up by 1640 in the US. So let's just finish up quickly, because I'm not going to uh, belabor the Southwestern story much, except to say that there's a whole number of things in our Southwestern and Mexican cuisines that we can fully attribute to these Arab and Sephardic Jewish influences from Capirotades that I've heard people say, well, that's a Ramadan food. Other people say, well, that's a Passover food. <laughs> Other people say that's a Lenten food, and we can trace it all the way back to Persia. It's a bread and uh, date and dried fruit pudding, bunuelos that are also called zulabilla, pan de semita, tezguino, the mildly fermented beverage that has been made with everything from dates to pineapples to other fruits. Uh, the big flour tortillas that we have, that we enjoy here, that, that uh, where chimichangas were first made, those enormous tortillas here, are exactly the same as some of the saj uh, uh, tortillas that, that came from Palestine with the Phoenicians to, to the uh, coast of Spain and Portugal five centuries before Christ, stayed in the dry areas of Spain and then got exported with wheat to the New World. So, and then moles, um, in particular, uh, that are called recaudos in the Yucatan Peninsula, those complex spice mixtures that now have chocolate and chilies in them. The entire formula for those is exactly what we see in Morocco with some of the, the sauces for tagines and can be traced back through Ziryab all the way to Persia. And they basically substituted things that they couldn't get easily, like, like black pepper, malagueta pepper, with chili peppers when they got chili peppers. And things that were brightly colored, like saffron or turmeric, were pla replaced by achiote and other New World spices. So it's the same formula as what has been used in the Old World for thousands of years in these very complex mixtures of sweet and savory. But we simply saw the introduction of of um, dominant New World spices replacing the things that were hard to come by from the Old World. OK, another lousy slide. That's the last one, though, I think. Maybe not. What I'm basically saying is that all of us who care about the, the history of cuisines have to be indebted to uh, Middle Eastern spice traders for diversifying what we find in any locality. That diversification came with the cost of globalization. And so my final comment in the book was that my lifelong long, lo, long love of aromatics from allspice to za'atar served as the genesis for this inquiry. But along the way, I realized if I love spices, I had to concede that their use is never politically, economically, or culturally neutral. That imperialism, cultural competition, and collaboration and social status are embedded in every bite we eat of those foods. And uh, finally, I wish to thank my, my own grandmother and my five aunts who not only taught me how to cook, but how to taste and how to laugh and how to love. Um, I think anyone from a Middle Eastern background obviously uh, has sentiments similar to this, that uh, you just feel pulled along by what you're grandmothers and your aunts instruct you to do whether you initially think you want to do it or not. 
Well, thank you so much.